We'll be talking about all kinds of product information on today's show, like whether or not electric cars are really going to catch on, and the kinds of progress that the Detroit 3 are making, especially Chrysler. We'll also be talking about which car company has the best reliability. That's because my special guest on today's show is David Champion, who heads up all the vehicle testing at Consumer Reports. He's the one who has to decide whether the new products that are hitting the market are truly competitive with what's already out there. And joining me on my journalist panel are Scott Burgess from the Detroit News and Daron Levine, who writes for Fortune Magazine and AOL. So stay right where you are. We've got a great discussion coming right up on AutoLine. From our studios in the Motor City, this is AutoLine. Here now is John McElroy. Welcome to our discussion here in the studio with David Champion from Consumer Reports. Great to have you back, David. Nice to be back. And joining us again today is Scott Burgess from the Detroit News. Great having you here, Scott. Thank you for having me. And Daron Levine, who writes for Fortune and AOL. Good well, having thanks, you back as thanks well. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. David, let's get into it. There's so many th different things to talk about. But, of course, one of the hottest topics in the industry right now is electric cars. I'm mm -hmm. just curious. You test all different kinds of cars. Have you had a chance to drive the Nissan Leaf and Chevy Volt? And what do you think? Uh, we've driven the Volt. Um, it's a very interesting car. And when you look at how far people tend to travel, uh, I think 40 miles is going to be pretty good. We recently had a uh, Toyota Prius plug-in that only got us about 16 or 17 miles, and we used it just buzzing around. We were surprised how much of that time was purely on electric. Um, so going to the vault at 40 miles and the fact that you're not stuck with, once you get to that 40 miles, you've got to recharge, but the engine cuts in and you can go as far as you want. I think it's going to be pretty good. So as you evaluate different kinds of cars, when it comes to these plug-ins or mm -hmm. electrics, do you have to test them differently or come at them with a different mindset? We generally come at them as they are. The only difference is when we're measuring fuel economy, of course, it's, it's how much does it go on electric, how much does it go on gas, and then how we work out what the overall fuel economy is of those vehicles. Uh, when we're looking at the LEAF, the LEAF with a 100-mile range, and then you've got to charge it for eight hours, I think that's going to be a different proposition for people. There's going to be a lot of early adopters that will want it, but past that, eh, the infrastructure just isn't there yet. So you're thinking, looking at sales in the market, that maybe plug-ins are the better way to go in terms of sales volume. I, I think so, because originally you've got gasoline cars, then you've got hybrids, now you've got these plug-in hybrids, and then full electric vehicles. I think the market's more of, more ready for the plug-in hybrids than they are for the full electrics at the moment. As, as the infrastructure gets that you can actually plug it in at work or wherever you are, and maybe at shopping malls and things like that, I think that would change to give you more range on an electric vehicle. Will consumers... Uh First of all, be willing to pay the premium that comes with a vehicle like the Volt, even if you get the $7,500 tax rebate, um, so it, that takes the Volt to $33,000. Mm -hmm. You're never going to see the difference in, in price. If you bought a Chevy Cruze, you're never going to make up that $10,000. Yeah. So are consumers willing to pay that? Not Chevy Cruze, Chevy Volt. No, if you bought a Chevy Cruze at eighteen or $19,000. Oh, compared to a Cruze. Yeah. Compared yep. to a, a Volt. You're never going to make up that, I see what you mean. that, right. that difference. Uh, I think the early adopters will. I, I think we see what has happened with Prius. When the Prius first came out, there was a lot of thought around the, the fact that it wasn't going to, you know, it was going to be unreliable. What was going to happen to the batteries? You know, why do I want to buy this thing? It's more expensive than a regular car. I, I think there's a market there for the, the Volt. Will it be a mass market, 400000 a year? No. I think one of the questions we really have to think about is how long will these subsidies last? We're looking at a situation now where state, local, and federal governments are putting up a lot of money, particularly out in California when you go to the LEAF. You're finding you have a very affordable car because it starts north of 30, and then when you pile in the federal subsidy and the state subsidy, plus some actual local subsidies, you can buy a very reasonable car for $20,000. Now, it has a limited range, but if you've already got one or two or three cars, it's certainly one mm -hmm. that you might want to add to your fleet. The question becomes now, and we were talking about this before, uh, how long will these governments 
be able to keep paying these subsidies. They're firing firemen, they're firing uh, teachers, they're firing um, uh, police officers, and they have to now justify the payments for these types of subsidies. I think it's a real question. Mm. Oh, a very legitimate, legitimate question. I, I've said all along, I give them three to five years max. When it comes to the federal tax credit, it applies to the first 200,000 quote unquote electric cars, and we can argue whether a Volt's an electric or not, but it will get the credit. Uh, so 200,000 is what each car company wants. General Motors is already petitioning the government to say lift the cap, but I think mm -hmm. you raise a great issue, Daron. Uh, you know, state and federal uh, governments are broke, and I can't see them handing out this kind of money when people are going to bed hungry. Well, you know, I had never driven this uh, Nissan Leaf, and I have to tell you, I was quite impressed. It was, uh, I would say, remarkably unremarkable. It was quiet. It uh, handled just like a car. People say, well, maybe a golf cart or something. That doesn't handle anything like a golf cart. It's, it's really a car. Obviously, the only limitation is the, the range. But uh, it was a very pleasant execution. I think Nissan's done a nice job with that, and they'll see some success with it. Oh, I agree totally. Uh, Nissan Leaf, I've driven ex extensively. It's a terrific car. The question is, Nissan is, I'm not saying betting the farm, but mm -hmm. man, they're plunging in head first. Mm -hmm. They're going to have the capability to build 150,000 in the United States, several hundred thousand in Japan, I think 50 or 60,000 in the UK. That's a big commitment mm -hmm. on, with a lot of question marks out there as to how many people really, truly are going to buy them or lease them because I don't think people will buy them. I think they'll lease them. And it's also the recharge time. You know, when, when your gas tank's empty, you go in, it's like five minutes and you've got another 300 miles. You know, with the Leaf, you're talking about six, seven, eight hours to recharge that battery. It's not as if you just... And that's on 220 volt outlet. Yes, that's if on If it's on a 120, it's like you could be talking... Well, uh, Nissan said if you have a depleted battery, it could be up to 20 hours to recharge yeah. it. So, you know, if you're going to the shopping mall or you're going somewhere and you, you plug it in, you know, you've got to be there a long time, and hopefully my wife isn't there for eight hours, because <laughs> otherwise my wallet is depleted as well as the battery. Um, so from that point of view, you know, you really, the, it's the range and the charge time, which is sort of the Achilles heel of the electric vehicle at the moment. Well, that's what I really like about the Volt, mm. is that it acts like an electric vehicle until you need it to act like a gasoline vehicle. And you can go every day back and forth from work and never use any gas, and then drive to Chicago and back mm -hmm. and never recharge. And uh, the real appeal to that vehicle is the fact that it can do both things. You know, it, it shows also how we've sort of uh, historically gotten ourselves connected to this mild per gallon uh, measure, which really isn't a very good measure at all when you're talking about the uh, Volt and useless when you're talking about the Leaf. Uh, we have to develop some kind of a metric with with the price of electricity, the amount mm -hmm. of electricity, the price of gas, the amount of gas, to sort of get you a better idea of what this is actually going to cost you because the mile per gallon um, artifice really doesn't work very well for the LEAF. Actually, the metric even has to go deeper than that, and some have argued that it should be a well-to-wheels yeah. basis, you know, as you right. pull the oil or whatever mm -hmm. it, fuel that you're using, coal or whatever, out of the earth, all the way to turning the wheels on the car. Others would say, no, it should be cradle to grave, mm. you know, because you've got to look at the recycling of the batteries in an electric car. And by the way, there is not one recycling center in the United States today that will handle lithium ion no. batteries. The power electronics that goes into hybrids and electrics, very, very expensive, very energy intense to recycle. Mm -hmm. So some are saying you got to go to cradle to grave. And I would say, no, you got to go even beyond that. Mm. It's got to be cradle to cradle because just dumping a bunch of stuff in the grave, i.e. landfill, is not really a sustainable solution either. I think that's certainly true if you're talking about what the true energy costs are. If you're talking about what are the costs of my wallet, though, you really have to figure out what am I paying for electricity mm. and how much am I using to charge this thing up? I think it's quite reasonable, but you still want to know. But electrical uh, rates ch you know, change so dramatically across exactly. the, the country. You can get anywhere down to seven cents, and where we are in the northeast, it's 19 cents a, you know, a kilowatt hour. So it's like three times the price. You don't see that price difference with gasoline across the country, maybe 10, 15, 20 True, percent. but electricity still is a lot cheaper than gasoline. Yes. And, and the other part with electricity is um, people right now, consumers are seeing it as free. Mm -hmm. um, they don't wait till their electric bill goes up $100 or $50 or whatever mm -hmm. it is a month that it costs them to charge up their car. 
Um, some of the tricks that some of the car makers want to use include heating up your car before you unplug it. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be an additional drain on your like you'll maybe get some additional range, but you're not going to you're going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And then are companies and businesses all going to have free outlets, or are we going to have something that is like the airport where we're all scrambling to plug in our computers mm -hmm. before we get on a long flight? And if there's only two outlets and three electric cars, who gets that outlet? Yeah. There's another issue too. Our roads and bridges are crumbling. Mm -hmm. Why? Because states are not getting enough revenue from the gasoline tax. Well, if you start charging up your car in the wall socket, you're not paying any road mm -hmm. tax. So there will be, and I guarantee you, yeah. it will happen. The states are gonna have sure. to figure out mm -hmm. another way to tax plug-ins and electrics so that they make up uh, or pay their fair share of what we need to yeah, maintain our roads. Ultimately, it's a user tax, so mm -hmm. the user will get soaked either at right. the gas tank or at the electric. So cycle. the electric company will take your road tax. <laughs> yes. <exactly. laughs> or, or the price of gasoline goes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or they start taxing the rest of the people more and pushing the, 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 the gasoline tax up more, which may help the, the electric vehicles and the... And well, the don't hold your breath because I've been no, arguing for a gas tax forever and I don't see it happening. Yeah. But enough of electrics. Let's go on to one of the other topics. Uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the Detroit automakers are really getting their act together. Uh, they're no longer just pushing out cheap junk because their business model almost forced them to go that route. Uh, I understand that you were in to drive Chrysler's new products mm -hmm. fairly recently with your team. And uh, I hear via the grapevine that you guys loved what you saw. And I'm just asking, is that true? Did you really like what you saw at Chrysler? We, we thought from where the cars are today to where hopefully the cars are when they're produced. These were early prototypes that we drove. Um, Phenomenal change, absolutely incredible change in the interior execution of the interior trim because Chrysler's, you know, were really they were the masters of cheap gray plastic. Oh, cheap, chintzy, awful. Um, but the, the new interiors are really nice. They've really tied down steering and handling so they don't wallow like an old boat. And, you know, the, the styling changes they've made have also really um, got away from, you know, the 300C was a great car when it came out, but it had a number of deficiencies, especially forward visibility, you know, trying to look for the traffic lights and things like that. They've moved the, the top of the A-pillars back, so you've got a much larger windshield, which makes driving a lot more enjoyable because you're not trying to peer out of a letterbox to, you know, see where you're going. Um, probably the most impressive change was in the uh, Dodge journey and we always thought the journey was about the right size it was a, a reasonable sort of small SUV four-wheel drive fitted the the bill but it was such an awful vehicle that you didn't really want to drive it the engine was noisy the interior was awful the ride and handling wasn't very good but the new journey that we tried was really impressive okay now again via the grapevines the story goes that you got out of this car and told the Chrysler people that you couldn't believe yourself saying this but you could even see yourself buying a journey Yes, it, it's a, it was a very impressive package when you're looking at a small SUV. It, it's extremely competitive. Uh, you know, we haven't tested it yet, so we don't know, you know, if it's got any handling or braking issues or fuel economy or, or anything like that. But just as a, a getting into the car and, and driving it as a, as a normal consumer would, you know, off the showroom floor, it was really impressive. What do you think changed here in such a short time at Chrysler? Well, again, you know, when they, the big three, had a business model where it was cheaper to build a car than to not build it. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that a minute. It's cheaper not to build a car. And so you just blow them out the door because you've got to pay all the workers whether they're working or not. So the theory goes, if we're going to pay them, we may as well have them work. So we're just going to make cars. Even if there aren't customers out there, we're going to entice them into putting $3,000 on the hood. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, now we've heard our residual values. So now we've got to make the cars cheaper because we can't get it in pricing. So the only way we can protect our margins is to make the cars as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's why we get cheap gray plastic interiors with no technology in the mm -hmm. engine or powertrain. And that's all gone. I mean, you know, the Obama administration came in and it waved a magic wand and it made most of Chrysler's and GM's legacy costs mm -hmm. go away. And Ford had the foresight and good luck to yep. borrow the money ahead of time. <laughs> but it went through the same sort of restructuring. Yep. And voila, they've lowered their break even to the point now that they can invest a lot more money in their cars and be competitive again. So you've suggested another reason why we're not going back anytime soon to 15, 16, 17 million 
uh, vehicle years because the business model has changed so that the three Detroit makers now are making fewer cars, better pricing, more profit, and will have to be uh, 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 confident and, uh, and, and keep that model for a while. Well, they, they've kept their foot on the brake when it comes to production. They watch mm -hmm. that day supply like a hawk. Mm -hmm. They literally watch it every single day. And if they see day supply starting to get up, that means too much inventory. So dealers now are under pressure to cut deals to get people to buy it. They don't do that. And in fact, the biggest complaint I hear from dealers of all different they makes, cars. they can't get enough cars. They know they could sell more if they could mm -hmm. get them. But, and it's not just Detroit, it's all not, the automakers are watching this like, like they never have before. But the, but the consequence of that is we need fewer dealers. Uh, well, we had too many anyway. Yes, so well, that's what I'm saying. We're saying the same thing. We need fewer dealers. Right. But uh, what I would say is I still think we will see car sales at some point in the future, in the next decade, go back to where they were, 16 million units mm -hmm. more or less. You know, we got up to 17 million because we had credit like we'll never see again, cheap credit like we'll never see again. But as I keep pointing out, the population of the United States grows by 3 million people every year. We add a million more licensed drivers. They're going to need cars. So at yep. some point, car sales are going to go up again. And right now in the, in the market, you're seeing used car sales continue to go up. It gets to the point that the price of used cars is going up. And so it gets to the point where... Don't buy the $14,000 two-year-old Civic. Buy the $17,000 brand-new Civic. I mean, it, it, all of yep. those vehicles. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's an arbitrage, the same kind of arbitrage you have between uh, rental housing mm -hmm. and, buying, and buying a house. At some point, the mortgage payment gets to the point where you're a renter, and at some point, the rental payment gets to the point where you're a buyer. David, yeah. uh, Consumer Reports just came out with... Uh, uh, its latest analysis mm -hmm. of the reliability of cars and the like. Walk us through that a bit because it looks like, you know, it's the same old story. The Americans are catching up, yep. but the Asians are still on top, although I guess there's a new wrinkle. Mm -hmm. The Europeans maybe not doing as well. No, what, what we're seeing is basically Honda is still you know, the most reliable manufacturer. Toyota's taken a slight knock uh, this year due to all the recalls uh, and some of the other internal problems they've had. Um, but then Ford is getting really close to where Toyota is. Ford, over the last five or six years, have been making you know, substantial improvements in their reliability. And rather than seeing just a quick peak where everything's hunky-dory, this systematic approach, I think, has really led them to uh, the point where, you know, you take a Ford Fusion is the most reliable family sedan, and the Toyota Camry, which was the poster child for reliability, is about average now. So you take where they've got to, and they've really improved. But I think the big news this year is where General Motors have come from. Hmm. Um, when we look at reliability, if a car is reliable out of the box, in other words, the first year it comes out, it's reliable, usually that reliability stays with it because that means the design, the development, the, the, the uh, suppliers are all in line when that car comes out. Uh, what we've seen from General Motors is a number of new products come out, the Cadillac SRX, the Buick LaCrosse, the new um, Equinox, uh, and the Camaro, all above average reliability, average or above reliability, out of the box, which is a really good sign. And we haven't seen that before from General Motors. No, General Motors generally, they'd launch a car and then carry on developing it for the first year or two years. And, you know, the customer would be the, you know, the development engineer getting the, the car right. And by the time the car went out of production and they'd started the new one, they'd finally got it right. You, know, you take something like the uh, Fiero. You know, the Fiero, when it first came out, was appalling. By the time they actually finished it, it was a freaking good car. Yeah. But you know, that's too late by then. <laughs> yeah, well, GM's had a history of getting cars right and then having to kill them off. Yeah. So it's good to hear that they're launching it with very good reliability. Yep. So reliability, reliability is a question of what your readers tell you about your cars. Is that right? It's based on surveys? Yes, it's a survey. Every year we send the, the questionnaire out to... We actually have 7 million subscribers, but it only goes to 5 million of those because some people don't like to give us the right. email address, etc. And we got back information on 1.3 million vehicles this year. How does, your, um, how does your reliability data align with the reliability data of others like J.D. Power that use different methodology? Is it, is it, is it similar? We just look at things gone wrong. Okay. Did you have a problem in the last 12 months with your car that um, was cost, trip to a dealer, safety, etc.? 
did you have a problem with your car? When you look at JD Powers, there's a number of design issues. Are you happy with the fuel economy and various other things? So it, it's it's like two different surveys in, in some ways, two different methodologies. We just look at, did you have a problem with that car? So we're really looking at purely reliability. Did you find, as JD Power did, that people are more critical of their Toyotas now? Because that was astonishing to me in the JD Power data that people who the year before said this car is terrific after all the recalls, the unintended acceleration issue and those sorts of things, J.D. Power saw, uh, showed a definite drop in what people were reporting on mm -hmm. their Toyotas. And I'm sure in 12 months time that really did not change in the real world. No. I think it was just that people felt maybe more honest than they had been before and were reporting yep. problems maybe that they may have overlooked. Maybe we in the press brainwashed them with all these <laughs> negative headlines all the time. They finally said, I got to come clean. I don't know what's wrong with it. Is, there a, lag, be wrong is with there a lag time on that? Is, will it, the, this has not been their best year for Toyota. No. And uh, next year in the survey, is that something that might start to appear? Or? We, we, so we definitely saw a drop in, in reliability. We don't ask, we say don't include a recall if you didn't experience the problem. Because we feel that if you get a recall notice, you've never um, had the problem, you can take it in at your own convenience, have the recall done, maybe at the same time as a service or whatever. So we don't see it as, as, a, as a really big issue. And recalls in general, I don't see as a, as a bad idea. If there's a, a safety defect on the car, you know, please go out and fix it. Uh, we, do, uh, we do require or ask them if they have experienced the problem, before the recall came out to check, to check the box. And when we look at the Toyota Prius, the Toyota Prius over the past 10 years has always had excellent reliability all the way across. This year it was down to only average reliability for the new 2010 model year, and it was all in the braking system. So a large number of Toyota um, Prius buyers actually experienced the problem before Toyota recalled it. Now, and you guys uncovered that also with the Ford mm -hmm. Fusion too. Mm -hmm. Was that problem there before, or did it only show up on the 2010 model of the Prius? It was only on the 2010 Prius. It was, okay. a, diff it was a different design, and also the Lexus HS 250, mm -hmm. which is uh, similar in some By ways. By the same token, David, if somebody didn't experience a brake problem mm -hmm. with the Prius, and you read what you read, you would have to take it in anyway, and then you would have to mark the box that I took it in, right? But you would take it in on your own... Um, timing. It didn't break down. It didn't break right, down. No, of course, it didn't break down, but it would count against its reliability when you got the survey, correct? Not necessarily. No? Not necessarily, unless you actually experienced the problem. Okay. And if you experienced the brake problem, you know. It's unnerving. <laughs> it it's is. It's very unnerving, right? And it was very similar to the, uh, the Ford Fusion Hybrid. Um, you know, they did a service advisory and basically the same as a recall, just not called a recall, um, and brought all those vehicles back in and, and fixed them. Um, but again, that was a very unnerving, you know, we're experienced drivers, we've driven many, many millions of miles and one of our engineers said, coming up to a stop sign and just felt like the brake pedal went away and quickly made the corner and where we live there isn't anything out there. so. And maybe a few chickens running across, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, we're getting down to the end, but let's go back to GM a minute. Why did they, or how, I should say, did they improve their reliability? They got rid of a number of brands. They shrunk yeah. down the number of models they have. Was that it, or were they doing something different, in your opinion? It, it's both in some ways. They, they got rid of Saturn, Pontiac, and Hummer. None of them were stellar in terms of reliability. So that moved that away. Um, but I think... When they redesigned things like the, the Lacrosse, the Equinox, the SRX, they realized that they're in the tubes in terms of reliability. And really, it's a different mindset, I think, at GM. And, and this is nothing to do with the, um, the bankruptcy and, the, and everything else. This is way, way, this is four or five years ago that this started to try and really improve going forward. It takes a long time to get a car company turned around and the product. It takes about a year to lose your credibility, and it takes you about five to ten years to get it back. Real good. Well, David Champion, we have to wrap it up here, but thanks so much for coming thank in. Thank you very much. And Daron Levine, thank you. And Scott, thank you for coming in. And I'll be back in a moment with some closing thoughts. I really want to see how Consumer Reports ends up evaluating the Chevrolet Volt and Nissan Leaf, especially when it comes to living with those cars in everyday situations. 
And it was very interesting to hear David Champion talk about their experience with the plug-in version of the Toyota Prius and how it met most of their needs, even though it only has a 15-mile pure electric driving range. That means Toyota could get away with a smaller battery pack, and that could give it quite a cost advantage. We'll be keeping track of those developments as the news breaks, and you can too, with AutoLine Daily. That's the newscast we do every day that you can get emailed directly to your computer or your smartphone. Check it out at AutoLineDaily.com. But that brings us to the end of this show. For all of us here at AutoLine, thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week.